his conclusion that it is morphine. You know, you know poppy plants, opium poppies, they have the enzymes for producing narcotics, opium. And a cow's liver, by a fluke of nature, has similar enzymes that make morphine and codeine. There's not a lot of it, there's just tiny traces, especially in the spring, less in the fall. But the, the amounts are so small, I don't think that's why some people get hooked on dairy. What seems to be more important is something called casomorphins. Have you heard of these? Hey, you've heard of casein, C-A-S-E-I-N, the dairy protein? All proteins are strings of beads. Each bead is an amino acid. Those are the building blocks of protein. In your digestive tract, that protein breaks apart and the individual beads get into your bloodstream and your body can turn them into muscles or skin or internal organs or whatever. But casein does not behave that way. Casein is a long string of amino acids like other proteins, but in the calf's digestive tract, it's broken into not individual amino acids, but strings of four or five or seven. And they're biologically active. They have opiate activity. By that I mean they act like mild narcotic drugs. They're not that strong. The strongest is about one-tenth the power of pure morphine. But if any of you were ever in the hospital and you got a pain, uh, a pain killing drug that was in the narcotic class like morphine or Demerol, the biggest side effect is that you get constipated fairly quickly. Well, if any of you ever did a big cheese overdose, that breaks apart into these narcotics and one of the principal side effects is exactly the same. It's a narcotic-like effect. Now, for chemists in the audience, this is what the casomorphins look like. And it raises the question, what the heck are they doing there? Why would we have opiate compounds in milk? And I want to offer you my theory. My theory is that nature doesn't like leaving anything to chance. If the baby calf did not like nursing and turned away and said, Mom, I'm just going to go wander in the woods today. Or if a breastfeeding baby turned away from the breast, they wouldn't do well. They wouldn't thrive. So nature builds milk with protein and fat and sugar and hormones and growth factors of various kinds and a nice little narcotic effect so that the casomorphins go to the baby's brain and cause a little bit of sedation. And for, for any of you who have ever looked at a baby as he or she is nursing, they get this funny look on their face. And then they doze off to sleep, and we think, my lullabies were so compelling. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, you just drugged the kid. <laughs> and now nature never figured that we would continue consuming milk. But what I'm suggesting is that the mother-infant bond has a biological basis in drug-like compounds and that the human refrigerator bond kind of works the same way. Um, now, is it a good idea to break away from cheese? Well, here are the, the figures. The calorie content of cheese is huge. It's probably the most fattening food that people include in their diets. Two ounces of cheese, which is about as much as you top a sandwich with, has close to 200 calories and lots and lots and lots of fat, mostly the bad fat, the saturated fat. That's the kind that makes your cardiologist get kind of woozy. Um, the cholesterol content is high, too. If you compare it to sirloin steak, ounce per ounce, it's as bad or worse. Okay, did any of you have arthritis or migraines or digestive problems that got better when you got away from dairy products? Anybody experienced that? It's the most amazing thing, isn't it? Where people who live for years with these conditions, the doctors do all kinds of expensive tests, and then one day somebody says, why don't you stop dairy products? And suddenly, your body gets back to the way nature wanted it to be. <clears throat> I think this is most important, perhaps not even for adults, for kids. If any of you have known a kid who has migraine headaches, it's the most tragic thing, especially for a kid who gets them frequently. These kids, it, it's not a tension headache. It's not, I've kind of had a bad day. These kids have pounding pain, and it, it throbs all night long and into the next day. These kids don't play. They don't think, they don't read, they don't go to school, they don't do anything. What they do is they lie in the dark, trying to fall asleep. It's because they know that if they can just fall asleep, then they might wake up without the headache. And researchers have found that in about 80% of these kids, you can identify one or more diet triggers. When you take those out of their diet, they never have another headache, or very, very rarely. And the diet triggers for migraines are dairy products, chocolate, eggs, citrus fruits, meat, 
wheat, nuts, tomatoes, onions, corn, apples, and bananas. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with a banana. But if you're allergic to strawberries and you get a rash, you can't have strawberries. If bananas trigger a migraine, that's a problem for you. Dairy is at the top of the list. And arthritis, same story. For many, many people, their joints are just grinding, and when they get away from dairy, they get better. Okay. Um, let me take a couple of minutes and talk about something that is really critical. Every cancer researcher in America knows this, and other people, it's, it's not on our collective radar screen, and that's milk and prostate cancer. Have you heard about this? It started out as just an observation. If you compare countries that consume a lot of dairy products versus those that have dairy products very rarely, the Scandinavian countries have quite a lot of dairy. North America, same story. We have a lot of, I have no idea what's causing all of this. No, the doctor knows instantly this is alcoholism, and I'm not going to send you down to the liver specialist and the eye specialist and the dermatologist to look at your nose. What we are going to talk about is how to separate you from this condition that is from, from this substance that is causing all of these medical conditions. Same doctor's office. A guy walks in. He's had a heart attack. His cholesterol is going up. He has a touch of diabetes. He has high blood pressure, and he's got gout. The doctor now will give him five diagnoses, send him to five specialists, write five different prescriptions, and nobody ever says, wait a minute. It might make sense to think of this as if you are hooked on a substance which is causing all of these to manifest. And when we break that food seduction, all of these things will improve or perhaps even go away. And what I'm suggesting is that is exactly the direction that doctors have to go into. Now, what is the value of breaking the meat seduction? Well, the first is you reverse heart disease, as Dean Ornish has so amply showed. You lose weight. Cancerous drops by about 40%. And have you seen the new work on breast cancer? Just came out about a couple of weeks ago that animal fat is linked to breast cancer. Now, there are many other contributors, of course, but this is a really important one. Uh, blood pressure. When a person goes on a vegetarian diet, if they have high blood pressure, their blood pressure drops. In many, many cases, you get them off all their drugs and their blood pressure is lower than when they were on medicines. Diabetes improves. We did a pilot study, small study, with individuals with type 2 diabetes, and we used a vegan, low-fat diet and what we found is that two-thirds of our people came off all their drugs or were able to reduce their dose inside of 12 weeks. And I'm happy to tell you that the National Institutes of Health are now funding us to do a larger study using a vegan diet in 68 individuals with type 2 diabetes we're recruiting right now, and they go on the diet from January through June of 2004. Um, thank you. Thank you. And you've seen, you've seen the new work on Alzheimer's disease suggesting that when cholesterol levels are low, and fat intake is low, and vegetable and fruit intake is high, that Alzheimer's disease is much less common. Now, here's the bad news. For a lot of folks, they will say, well, I don't eat much red meat, but I eat white meat. Well, the leanest beef is about 29% fat as a percentage of calories. The leanest chicken is about 23. Now, fish vary. Some are lower, some are higher. But broccoli is only 8% fat, and beans are 4% fat. Rice is 1 to 5, a potato maybe 1% fat, until we put the butter and sour cream and cheese doodles and bacon bits on top, and then it gets right back up. Now, I, I have to say, I, I give lectures in different parts of the country, and I've noticed that when you talk about vegetarian diets, there's some places that it doesn't go over too big. I was giving a talk in Lubbock, Texas, a few years ago, and I noticed that I'd been invited to speak at Texas Tech, and... I didn't realize when I went there that they have a class there called Swinology 101. It's, it's, an, it's an agriculture school, and the reason people go there is they want to become ranchers. But anyway, I'm talking about how people should do a vegetarian diet that would reverse heart disease and make them live longer, and the audience doesn't like this. And I, I pretty soon notice they're kind of grumbling a lot, and one or two people are heckling me. And I realized, here I am in the middle of cattle country advocating a vegetarian diet. But the fact is, my grandpa was a cattle rancher, and my dad grew up on a cattle ranch, and my uncles and cousins are all in that business. So I don't consider them the enemy. I consider them to be people at the same risk as everybody else, and they need this message. So I'm describing to these guys in Lubbock about how particles of cholesterol enter the artery, artery wall, and they cause artery blockages to gradually grow, and that causes heart attacks, and we have 4,000 of them every single day. 